dog. All right, cool. Okay. All right. Cool. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Bonus Point Rugby Podcast. Once again, I'm your host, TJ Olson. Very pleased to be joined by our regular guest analyst, Mr. Tavita Halafia, aka Novel Capote. Uh, before we get started, I just want to start off by thanking our amazing sponsors. First off, Whale Bird Kombucha. If you're looking for a great tasting beverage that is actually good for you, go try them out at your local Whole Foods, Air One, or other health food stores. Secondly, F45 Culver City. So F45 isn't just a gym. It's a real community and a team are all here to help you achieve your fitness goals for sessions in just 45 minutes uh currently they're doing outdoor workouts in los angeles to avoid uh covid19 restrictions so be sure to reach out to them to get a great workout during these trying times uh so as we all know the pandemic has changed the way we look at a lot of aspects of life and this has also altered the game of professional rugby as we know it however australasia has been the pioneers and trailblazers for their own individual competitions with a super rugby au and arterial competitions they've both been amazing to watch uh, with that in mind i'm very pleased to welcome in our next guest on the pod today he's a guy that i've watched evolve and develop over the years playing grassroots rugby in brisbane and is now playing in the new super rugby au competition for the western force which a lot of people didn't think would they would hear uh please welcome current hooker for the western force fleti kaitu what's going on brother how we doing fleti, fleti, Boys, fleti. thanks for having me no, it's good to have you, Bo. Um, just before we get stuck into the interview, I just really want to congratulate you on the season you've had. Obviously, we just had a chat before, but um, how competitive and how how impactful the Western Force have really been in this competition. Um, obviously, with, with most of those games, you guys haven't been able to put those into wins yet, but a lot of people kind of ridden you guys off even before you got into competition. Not me. Saying that, yeah, Not me. Especially, especially us. A lot of people are saying that rapid rugby is two di completely different games, but... Um, I, I'm really happy to see you going from all the way from grassroots at South and getting this opportunity in rapid rugby, super rugby. Glad to be taking taking the bull by the horns and getting this opportunity. So, yeah, how's how's everything going? Yeah, it's been – oh, th thanks very much for the um, the support, the starters, boys. Um, yeah, it's, it's been really awesome. Like, ever since I uh, arrived at the, at the Western Force when uh, sort of – the, the, the year after they initially got picked out of Super Rugby. Um, so I arrived that next season and obviously didn't have to deal with the with the pain that that previous squad had dealt with. Um, mm. But from that day one, like, all we were focused on was um, keeping rugby and WA strong. And and regardless of, of the teams we faced or, you know, what challenges laid ahead. Um, we were just focused on becoming better rugby players and better people um, every day. So. Mm, no, that's that's great to hear. So uh, I think you guys have, have done that justice um, in both competitions and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the future. Uh, but t today I thought we'd kind of... Uh, center around your career and delve into things like Super Rugby AU and, and a few other things. But I first want to talk about the foundation of your rugby career. And that's obviously where you started. So uh, me and Hala both know you, you grew up in Brisbane and you, you played your junior rugby and some senior rugby at Souths. And that's obviously our club together. That's why we had one of our first connections. Um, what was it? Um, we got a fellow brothers guy coughing, coughing and moaning over there. But, <laughs> um, but what, what was it? What was it like growing up playing for South? Uh, like, honestly, you can't describe it. Sometimes, like when you think about, you know, why we play rugby and stuff, and and sort of that enjoyment. Like, those some of my fondest memories, you know, uh, go back to the those days down at, at Chipsy Wood. Um, it was actually quite funny because um, we always lived on the north side of, of Brisbane, so around sort of where Hala was from. Um, and when we initially moved up uh, to Brisbane from Newcastle, I was born in, in New South Wales, though I support the Maroons. 
<laughs> yeah, um, boy. Yeah, we, boy. Yeah, initially moved up to, to Brisbane when I was about around five, five years old, six years old. And um, my old man's actually related to Dolte Gekko's um, mum and his dad as well. But um, I think it's a bit closer on his mother's side. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, Dolte's strong connection and like the Kefu's strong connection to South um, was there, obviously. And and she asked my old man if I if I wanted to play footy. And um, yeah, I guess sold my dad. And we'd been doing half an hour trips, forty minute trips from the north side to South since I was like five years old. So yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's where it all started, I guess. And and it's always home for me, to be honest. Mm. And, and we just spoke about it before. We've got a fellow brothers player on the show. So, obviously, um, we know how yeah. big that club rivalry is because yeah, we both experienced it. So, yeah, <laughs> so did Hawa. Um, yeah, to, for some of our listeners that don't know what it's like preparing and playing yeah. against a team like that with that type of rivalry, can you kind of explain your your th- thought process or how you feel going into that game? Yeah. Um, well, what... When it came around to high school, I actually went to school with a lot of those boys that, you know, um, played for brothers at Nudgy, right? So, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we'd play together on a Saturday and then come Sunday, we'd be facing up against each other. But for some reason, as soon as they pulled on that um, butcher stripe, like they just seemed to turn into like, <laughs> to lose. <you> know? <laughs> I don't, think I I don't know what you're talking about, Flitty. I don't I'm know what you're say, talking about, mate. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's there's obviously a reason why they're called the filth. And it was literally yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, like I, I don't even think I don't even think we need to delve into it anymore. That was no. the perfect representation of yeah. No, nah, I'll, yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. So there is so, the, the the defense rests. We've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like you said, you obviously had you had a, quite a great schoolboy career at Nudgee College, and and you were after that you were named in the Australian schoolboy side. What what did it mean to you to be named in a side, especially because you were the youngest player in that side at sixteen years old? Yeah. Um, I think just luck- luckily enough, I was born in December 30, like literally almost the last day of the year. So I think I got lucky in terms of being the youngest. But um, no, it was, ac- it was actually funny because um, for starters, my old man didn't actually want me to play first 15 in year 12 because he was like all throughout my high school years and, and stuff. He was, he was always adamant on me, you know, putting my... Um, studies first and, and everything mm. and, and trying to push for the highest, um, you know, final year 12 um, OP possible. Um, and so he was, he was always on, on the verge. Like he, he supported my, my rugby and stuff, but he, he never wanted it to, to be a hindrance to my um, ability to perform academically and stuff. So it was a tricky one. Um, I actually, yeah, um, wasn't didn't have the intention of, of playing first of Dean or schoolboys or anything like that. But we had a new coach come in, um, Anthony Canellan, um, that season, and um, and he liked what he saw. Um, and in terms of positioning, I threw in the lineouts at hooker, but then I had to scrum at loose head because it just worked better mm. for some for some reason with the team dynamics, like. So our hooker wasn't big enough to scrum at prop at that stage. So I, oh, okay. I scrummed at prop and then I threw in the lineouts as well. And I actually ended up making Queensland schoolboys and Australian schoolboys as a loose head. But that was my first ever year of um, a playing position. So it was a yeah, it was bizarre and and never imagined that I'd go have gone that far. You know, having been the first year to to play prop, but. I guess it's just like, just like my rugby journey. You just got to go off the flow and see what happens. Though. Yeah. Just yeah. as a um, as a high school student um, trying to juggle, you know, everyone that knows um, Australian and New Zealand first fifteen rugby knows that if anything, it's your introduction to professional athleticism, professional rugby. So you know, to any listeners coming through um, playing at that level, how did you find and how did you juggle? 
the pressures of first 15 rugby as well as maintaining you know your academic um you know standard at a at a high level which you did uh very what looked to be very easily coming through it was not easy at all bro um i can tell you that but yeah. um yeah no i think you need to sacrifice a bit of sleep for starters if you you're really after chasing those things um but in terms of, of, of Nudgee College, like, you know, everyone knows, you know, around Australia and around the world as, as well, how much of a rugby nursery it is. Um, I guess it's just the standards that, that um, you know, you're ex- that are expected of you. And, um, mm-hmm. and just the emotional connection that the boys have with that jersey, like, I guess, People sort of talk about it in ter- like it's it's got no real um, you can't really compare the two, but it's probably the best way that I can think about it in terms of the connection that the All Blacks have to the to the you know that black yeah. jersey. Yeah, I mean, yeah. um, with that Nudgy jersey, the boys would literally do it for free, no questions asked. You know what I mean? Like we do obviously do it for free, but in terms of um, you know, just, yeah, the, you'd literally put your body on the line, your life on the line for that jersey. And how, that's just how much love you have for the, the school and, and wanting to um, make your family proud, the school proud, and, yeah, and man. you know, keep yourself. I think that's definitely something that gets portrayed really well in the new um, – I think it's Onion TV is the is the company that did like a whole season on the That's Nudgee right. College. Um, they did, they did a whole season. Um, I think it was two thousand and big GA was the uh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Alexander and, was the coach yeah and obvi- obviously obviously like we know it growing up in that GPS GPS program and and understanding how much that jersey means. But if anybody ever wants to understand that mentality or putting your body on the line for that Jersey, watch that, watch that jockey series. Cause that was incredible um, to get that yeah. insight. Um, and you obviously stated that you, you never thought that you would go on, on and play Australian schoolboys, but you went on um, and you had your campaign and it was a bit of a roller coaster for that team. You, you lost your first game to England, but your second match was a very historic win against New Zealand. Now, New Zealand are known for always putting together strong schoolboy sides. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think I've ever looked at a schoolboy side in New Zealand and gone, then they're not going to get past the team. They're, they're always known as the people that are either going to make a run at it or take it out. And you had a team, you were going up against guys like Artie Savia, Paddy Toops, Nani Lamapi, even Roger Tuivasa Shek, he was on the bench, all rising stars and superstars today in their respective sports. What was it like to get a win against such a quality schoolboy side who were always favoured to win? Yeah, it was it was phenomenal. Like, we um, obviously didn't know who those those uh, boys were at the time, um, mm. you know, coming against them for the first time. Obviously, they've gone on to, you know, um, be obviously much bigger and better, um, you know, to put it humbly. Um, but in terms of our Australian schoolboy side, like we weren't made up of a team of superstars. Like we had a, a few individuals, but, um, we literally played, um, as a unit. And I, I feel like regardless of, of the individuals that they had, and obviously the, the insane talent that those guys had, because we, um, we built that game up a lot because you know what I mean? As Australians, versing New Zealand is is like everything. And you know, um, Australia having not won a game at schoolboy level for five years, we felt like it was a time that we the buck stopped with us and we put an end to it. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think it, it came back uh, a lot to our mindset around that game and and just just not not wanting to let New Zealand get one over us um, mm. and. I guess showing that pride in in our country, you know what I mean, in that gold jersey. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely a good way to put it. Hala, is there? You've obviously had an experience in going through the rugby system as well. Is is that kind of feeling going up against Australia and New Zealand? Would you say that's probably one of the biggest sporting rivalries, not just in rugby but just in general? 
Yeah, man, I think the one thing that Folletti touched on as well is, you know, when there's a precedent of the the losses coming via the Kiwis and, you know, anyone that doesn't understand it, it's, you know, we'll go to war for each other, but then, you know, we also, you want to one up the other, right? That's the, that's the whole beauty of the, the brotherhood between Australia and New Zealand. So um, I actually remember watching that game. I watched that game uh, on uh, IRB.com. And uh, I was thoroughly, uh, not going to lie, I was like, holy moly, what am I watching? <laughs> I'm not used to this. And I do remember, especially that game, um, there was a there was a bit of a size difference, mostly because New Zealand schoolboys too are like 17 to 19, not 16 and 17. Yeah, they, they always have an extra, year extra year on everyone. Yeah. yeah, and I just remember watching that game. And Folletti's right. One thing that came out of it was you were watching a whole team that were willing to, like that whole 23 – it was like you know a bunch of sharks all together just just fishing just going out hunting and whenever when it when it whenever there was points scored the whole team erupted and it was like it was to be fair it was probably the first time i've seen that in schoolboy rugby in a long time where the whole team were just really they were out for each other before they were out for themselves um but yeah i mean that i mean new zealand and new zealand and australian rivalry is the greatest thing in the world yeah um, <laughs> It's better than Tongas and Samoans. <laughs> <laughs> was was that the year that um it was Curtis Browning that was captaining you guys, or was that the year prior? Uh yes, Curtis was captain, I believe. Yeah, because because in because yeah. in two thousand and nine, to see him, I think he was basically the U of a U of two thousand and nine. He was he was the youngest youngest Australian schoolboy in that yeah, side, yeah. and yeah. to kind of. It's kind of the that's how that's how the rock rock falls. So it's it's good to see kind of the the young guns get their get their go early in schoolboys. But after after your career in schoolboys, you went and played a bit of prem grade rugby for Souths in Brisbane, obviously, and you you were then selected in the Australian under twenty side. And and we know that you obviously had a great international rugby experience with with your time with the schoolboys. But what was the transition like? to the caliber of international rugby for schoolboys to twenties is, was it something you felt you were ready for or was it a bit daunting? Um, I, I definitely felt I was ready for it. Um, I guess the hard part of, for me and, and probably if you look over those, those two squads that went at it, um, you know, in that Australian schoolboys, New Zealand schools game that we, we won, um, is sort of the, the transition of that cream of the crop, right? So, for example, 2011, that year that I made schoolboys, those 15, 23 players are literally the top 23 players in that country at that very moment, right? So um, I feel like that's where Australian rugby might be um, a little bit behind the able at the moment is is taking that cream and turning them into, you know, that next product. Yep. And, and yeah. not necessarily, um, you know, handing them stuff, but having, um, you know, having uh, pathways in place where these players can develop and keep nurturing their game to yep. get to that next level. Because if you, obviously we beat that side that um, on that day, but, They've had Ari Severa, Nani Laumape, Roger Tuivasashek, like among, and then not to mention the other guys who are like seasoned super rugby players now. Like, so th that team that we beat that day, majority of them have gone on to higher honours, right? Whereas you look at look at that Australian school side that um, you know that we won with that day, um, the conversion rate to that next level isn't as high. You know what I mean? Yeah. As that New Zealand school side we played, so I feel like there's a bit of a breakdown in terms of the pathways to that next level. Obviously, they've got Mitre Ten and, and all the rest of it, and they've they've got those pathways in place, and they've had them for a very long time. Which is like a, a it's um, no wonder why New Zealand rugby is so successful. But um, yeah. yeah, like if you ever get a if you ever get a chance. Just go and have a look at the the team list from that day, and, and sort of like I guess the the biggest name to come of it, come out of our uh, our side that day was probably Sean McMahon. Um, obviously, yeah. you know he 
he uh, played Aussie Sevens and, and Super Rugby and, and went on to be, become a Wallaby pretty quickly. Um, so, yeah, me and Sean went together, went to school together at, at Naju. Um, and, it, yeah, it was, uh, you know, you're so happy for him, but, you know, you just you just wonder how many other boys could have gone on, you know, to, to higher honours sooner as well if we might have had, you know, better pathways in place, um, yeah. you know, to sort of replicate potentially what New Zealand is doing and, and how they're able to get those guys to, um, to that next level. I think Huller and I have touched on that a lot, um, especially in recent podcasts. And I, I remember even talking to, um, to Sean's brother, um, Sam, and because me and Sam have been mates for a few years, ever since I was probably about 16, I knew him and I got to know Sean as well. And I think I brought that up to him is I sat there and I was, I was looking and going, I can't believe how much success um, your, your little brother is having. It's, it's awesome to see. But then I did my whole coaching analysis in my head. And then you sit there and you look at the teams and you go, you are right. The, the development or the, the kind of conversion rate is a lot lower than New Zealand in a lot of aspects. And Hala, do you have kind of anything that you would think as to why specifically that would happen? Or is it, is it just ARU is just a little bit more underdeveloped than New Zealand rugby? I don't think rugby Australia is underdeveloped. I just think they're the, how their business model is set up into the development of rugby here is, is faulty. I think you only have to look at, you know, the Reds establishment, you know what I mean? And the Waratahs and the Brumbies having, coming from, you know, the system in school where you're on that, you call it what you will, the, the Reds program or Waratahs program. And then it's almost like Faletti said, you finish high school. And what is there? There's club rugby that, what, you go to training three nights a week and then you play on a Saturday. There's nothing unless you're in those high end development, which you pocket, like you're not, you have to pay for it yourself. Like you have to somehow find a way to make training, still stay at uni and make a living um, comparatively to what you see in New Zealand rugby, where it's like, all right, you're in the system. Let's spread you out. And you can be from Auckland and end up in Dunedin and they're not, they do not care. You, you know, there's been numerous players from, you know, both North and South Island who aren't selected for their province. And then they get, you know, they go down, but that twenty twenty five thousand dollars a year to play rugby and develop yourself goes a long way as opposed to having like Rugby Australia where it's, all right, we like you, but we're not going to give you any incentive to come and play. And you, and you keep in mind, you still have to rock up for your club as well. It's not like you get, you're getting piggybacked. Do you know what I mean? So you could be at Brothers playing on the verge of playing premier grade, but you still got to rock up to uni, go to your part-time job and still rock up at Ballymore between 6.30 a.m. and 9.00 a.m. Do you know what I mean? At what point, and that's, I think what Fletty's saying is it hits it on the dot. At what point is the incentive to stay there when you, you know, comparatively, you're looking at your mates who have a social life, makes the money and are still going to have their degree or their apprenticeship sorted by the time you're still trying to make it out playing you know, premier grade rugby without, without even anything on paper saying we want you in our team. And the, there's been so many people, the likes of uh, Gavin Warren, who ended up playing two games because A, the Reds needed a prop and B, he just stuck around long enough that he was lucky enough to get a cap. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And mm. I, like rugby Australia have the resources. And to be fair, Western force are the only ones that are really putting the money in to make sure that their local grassroots are, are kept hungry and they can see that on the other side there is somewhere where you can play rugby and in in those in-between stages we will support you yeah no i definitely think you hit the nail on the head both of you guys i definitely hope that's a message to the aru and hopefully do things do change in in the future well railing's Um, gone so that's good (laughs) 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 sorry flirty you don't have to say anything no emotion (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just, I didn't, I'm sorry bro I didn't catch that oh, that's good, oh, the, the, that's good. The, the Wi-Fi the Wi-Fi cut out yeah we'll just we'll just leave it there yeah <laughs> and following following your 20s campaign you had to undergo a shoulder reconstruction and and to be honest you can you can throw a rock in pro rugby and and very easily hit someone who's had surgery or who's had a reconstruction but a lot of people don't know how difficult it is to rehab back from something as as serious as a reconstruction how, how did you, how difficult did you find it coming back from that kind of reconstruction or that, that difficulty in your career? Yeah. Um, like, thankfully that was actually my, well, sorry, not thankfully, but 
uh, fortunately, that was actually my first ever uh, shoulder reconstruction, like, you know, major injury that required, um, you know, surgery my whole my whole playing career. Um, so it was it's pretty, you know, uncharted territory for me and, and didn't really know um, what to expect, I guess. But all I knew was I'd already reached, I'd obviously reached, um, the, you know, the cream of the crop um, at 20s level again. So I'd reached the cream of the crop at schoolboy level. I'd done it again at under 20s level. So I knew I was there or thereabouts. Like, you know, I just needed, um, I needed something to go my way. So I knew that, yeah, I've, I've got a little step, uh, step back here with, with my shoulder, but, um, you know, the, the most important thing um, to follow was was that I worked hard and made sure I put myself in the in the best um, possible position to to be able to take an opportunity should it come. Mm. No, that's that's a good mindset. I think that goes out to a lot of people who who do go through injuries because no matter who you are, a lot of people they have their down days, especially when injuries come and you and you're on a progression to kind of elevate and become become somewhat of a success. So I think. Keeping that in mind, if anyone's listening and they've ever gone through that type of mentality, just stay positive, put yourself in a good position, and then go go hard. But uh, following the reconstruction, you went over the Story Bridge and you played some prem grade rugby for Jeeps, and I was just happy it wasn't for brothers. Uh, but but, but <laughs> hey, during that, what have I done? Leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not what you have done. It's it's how much we despise no. brothers. Well, Honestly, me personally, but <laughs> like Felicity said earlier, when the jersey goes on, there's no loyalties. It just switch switch <laughs> turns on. Um, but but during that time, you also were a part of the Reds wider training squad. And t- talk to us about the dynamic as as the Reds are one of the premier Aussie teams, having just won the championship three years ago in Super Rugby. You're learning from guys like Sia Fainga. You're running. You're rubbing shoulders with guys like Quade Cooper, James Horwell. Uh, you got Gilly Quirky in that squad. Talk to us about that. What what was that like? Yeah, it was it was, it was uh, a bit surreal. You know what I mean? Like coming in there as a young kid and having grown up. You know, watching these guys on on TV, obviously as cliche as it sounds, but yeah, it was literally a dream come true. So I feel like um, half the time I was in there, I was like literally just like, you know, tiptoeing around, not trying to step <laughs> on any toes and stuff rather than, uh, I guess, really um, accepting the fact that I, I'd, I deserve to be there and, and, you know, really sort of grab the ball by the horn. So um, in retrospect, I, I feel like I could have, potentially could have done more but I guess like being a young kid it's it's hard to avoid being in that sort of mindset where you you just it's it's unfamiliar it's territory and you just want to um I guess do everything right not not upset anyone and, yeah but you know like having learned what I've learned now um you know three years and three or four years into my professional career like um had I known what I know now, like I, I feel like I could have taken some more opportunities then, because um, it like I'd reached that level, but it was still a tough slog. Like I wasn't wasn't earning any money from from footy yet, still at that stage. Um, so I'd spent two years with the Reds, just in the wider squad, and wasn't earning a cent. So I had to I had to balance my uni work, um, work a part time job to support myself. Um, and then obviously try and focus as much as I could on on my craft with my rugby. So, um, yeah, it was it was a dream come true, but it was also like it was also a, a pretty tough grind as well. Damn man, that's that uh, that's that hustle like that, bro. Um, so during that whole like the wider squad development, we touched on it earlier. Did you find that what? Would you say that that was probably the most challenging in regards to maintaining the dream to make sure that you get to what your end goal would be as a professional rugby player? Yeah, like I guess if I uh, if there was some um, you know if there were some things in place that allowed me to just focus a bit more on um, on on bettering myself as a rugby player. Um, yeah. I feel like probably would have helped helped a whole lot in terms of getting to that next level 
um, sooner. Yeah, yeah, we definitely. There he is. We lost TJ. He's back yeah. now. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, guys. I think some technical difficulties. <laughs> um, yeah. I uh, think, so, I think, yeah, no, you go ahead. Hold on, sorry. I, no, I was just going to say, um, just touching on being in the, like, just how he found um, working, you know, the part-time job still at uni in the wider squad. Mm. Um, did you find that being, like, playing that rugby and then transitioning uh, into the newly... And the new NRC competition, how did you find that going from club rugby, being in a wider squad with the Queens and Reds and then going to play? What was, I suppose, the rejuvenated national rugby competition? How did you find that on a, on a level of skill-wise playing with coaching, being coached by training, et cetera? Yeah, I think the NRCs, um, you know, like when we saw that come through again, um, in terms of the, the Australian rugby pathway, um, it gave a lot of a lot of players hope. Like um, you know, there's there's actually quite a few players that have gone on now to be um, you know regular Super Rugby players. Mm -hmm. who literally came from from club rugby. Like hadn't done, hadn't gone to a GPS school, hadn't made school boys under twenties, all that. Um, they just rocked up on a Saturday for their respective clubs performed <laughs> yeah. and they were given an opportunity. And in terms of what we were talking about before with, with those pathways in place um, with New Zealand, like the NRC is um, definitely a step in the right direction, whether yeah, that's the, the, the be all and end all for the, for, you know, getting strain rugby to the, to the heights, you know, that we, we saw, um, you know, previously, um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like NRC is not the only solution, but it's it's definitely a step in the right direction. Like it's, we definitely need a medium between um, club rugby mm -hmm. and super rugby to be able to Agreed. develop and nurture those those guys playing club who are performing week in week out. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with that as well. It's um, there is there is kind of a a big a big gap in that in that, that chain where it, there does need to be a fill filler that goes in there. And there's been a lot of people um, all around the media, social media, everyone who has their own take on how we can kind of supplement that. Uh, but hopefully we'll we'll see with with new leadership in place in the ARU and a, and a few and Dave Rennie obviously at the at the helm as the head coach of the Wallabies. Let's hope that it kind of trickles down because he's obviously had a lot of success. Uh, but in the in the NRC, the, the Queensland countryside, you, you we spoke about him before, Tota Kefu um, and Brad Thorne, Jason Gilmore. What was it like getting coached by guys that are relatively known all around the world in the rugby community? Those names uh, baffled me when I when I first saw them as your coaching staff. Yeah, like um, coming off that season at Jeeps um, into NRC that year, like I'd say there was a fair bit of hype around me. Like I've played like not tooting my own horn but I, I had a really good season that it year. was a great um, season for Eddie. it's okay it definitely you, you can say that was, you yeah. had a great season yeah. that year man you've, all, you've always really been very season. humble <laughs> um, and yeah I guess to come and play under Dol Day and Brad Thorn, sort of similar to that um, situation that I was speaking about earlier with the Reds sort of like everything's surreal like you don't um you just would never imagine you'd be in a position where you'd you know be in the same room as as guys of that caliber uh of men of that caliber actually um and so yeah i feel like i just i wasn't i didn't give uh that nrc campaign as much as i'd like to have done um you know I just, yeah, coming off the back end of, of the season I had at Jeeps, um, you know, I was really ready to to have a breakout season at that next level and, and try and kick on to, to bigger things, you know, like try and get a full-time thing with the Reds and whatnot. But it obviously wasn't to be. And, you know, um, you always, I guess, got to trust in God's timing and, and that everything will, will work out in its in due course. So yeah, that wasn't obviously the time for me, 
I that, uh, that NRC season, I think I only started one game, two games, probably most. Um, but yeah, rubbing shoulders with with Brad Thorne and and Dolte, like guys, you just have the utmost respect for. Um, was a yeah, unreal experience. And I get. And I, 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 I think it's was... funny to say. You know, you go ahead. Um, but, you know, like in terms of island culture, like you obviously you treat your old man with like the utmost respect. Um, anything he says goes. And I feel like uh, in a team environment, that's how us island boys, you know, view our coaches, authority. Mm, um, you know what I mean? And, and so having learned what I have now at the force and stuff, it's okay to be able to, you know, speak up and have a chat to them and stuff. But I feel like in my early days, I was definitely in that mindset of, you know, like just just shut up and, you know, like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. regardless yeah. of what what I might what opinion I might have had or or any sort of um, you know work on uh, ideas I could have offered. You know what I mean? Like I I was quite reserved and and kept all that pretty quiet because. I just, just because out of sheer respect, you know what I mean, for, for yeah. guys that were at the helm. Yeah, it's, um, I think we spoke about it, um, me and Andy Muirhead in his interview, is is those kind of, when it comes to experiences or things you could have done, it's it's kind of a catch-22. You need to have those experiences to learn, to be, understand that you need to do that. And you won't, won't know to do that until you have those experiences. So I think it's something where as long as you are able to, kind of calculate that in your head and go, okay, I'll use these things to my advantage, what I've learned and then go for it and forward my career. I think you've got the best mindset, but I think the one thing I always found funny about the Queensland country name is that half the boys selected over the years were probably guys that you live, you live down the road from, or you, you like, were just, you, you played club rugby with at a local club next door. Were, were there a few boys that were actually from the country or out of the city or was it major, just majority of your mates? Yeah, no, uh, like, yeah, they definitely tried to pick a few lads that had a, a close connection to the country, like uh, uh, Matt Gordon was one of my good mates. Um, Matty Gordon uh, was a Toowoomba boy uh, from the country. I'm trying to think of some others. Doesn't, doesn't come Cause, to Because I, I would look at the yeah, team and of, I would yeah, see, I would see in the original really. season, it would be like Ryan Frenny. And I'd sit there and go, I saw him at my rugby club like last week. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. no, I don't think there was, were any real restrictions with where you had to be, uh, where you had to come from <laughs> to play for that, for that team. Yeah. It was definitely, it was definitely a mix around because I was like, Russ, weren't you just playing down uh, Yoki Road next minute? Yeah. <laughs> Queensland country. And then, you know, someone at North is playing City. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I, I don't yeah. know. What's going on right <laughs> Uh, well, at least at least the NRC is in place, and that's that's all we can be th- thankful for. But um, for in in 2017, this this was a surprise for me as well. When this happened, is, is you made a trip across the ditch, and you went to go play for New Brighton, a rugby club, and you were part of the Canterbury Mitre Ten Cup squad. So, when you think of rugby culture and success, especially at a provincial level, a, a lot of people's minds will immediately go to the Canterbury rugby system or the Crusaders. So, ha- how did? How did that opportunity come about to go play for or go be a part of that culture in that in that squad? Yeah. Um, so obviously, as we said before, I'd spent two years um, sort of, you know, in the, in the Reds wider system, um, and you know, coming on the back back end of that um, NRC season for for Queensland Country. All I really had on the table was to roll around again for a third year um, at Jeeps. So I'd, I'd missed my first season at Jeeps due to my shoulder um, and then had a good second year there. And then um, after that, and I see, as I said, I didn't probably take the opportunities um, that, that I could have. Um, and so I was stuck with just rolling around again, playing club rugby in Brisbane and I, I sort of sat there and, and thought about it all, and I was like, if I keep doing the same uh, same things, if I keep doing the same things, I'm, you know, I can't expect to see any different results. 
So if I want something different, I need to try something different, right? Um, so I yeah, rang my manager and I was like, mate, like, um, I'm not sick of it, but I feel like I want to be a professional rugby player. I need to shake shake the boat a bit, rock, rock the boat a bit and, and try something different um, so I can get things, you know, get things moving in terms of my career because I was, I was stuck between the decision of whether I call it a day on my rugby career and give everything to my study rather than half-assing both of them, mm. you know, trying to balance it. Um, and so I, I was like, um, can you put some feelers out and, and, and see who might be interested? So I got, um, I paid my cousin probably, well, I don't know what it was, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. <laughs> His name's um, Sion Nehelu. He runs that big athletic. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we go. Uh, Na'a was the first one to put my um, highlights together on his laptop. I sat there for like hours looking at the timings and everything that he, uh, just so he could come through and cut it all. He's pretty, he's pretty handy on the, um, on the old laptop. He is. He's got a lot of now too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. So he, he put a little highlights package together for me for that, from that GPS season. Um, and then whatever footage we had from the couple NRC games I played and sent, sent it around and, um, yeah, real random. The uh, the new Brighton Rugby Club in Christchurch. So that rugby club is where Ryan Crotty comes yeah. from. Um, I think he's probably their biggest name. A guy who used to play as well called Isaac Ross back in the day. But Crotty's their most uh, probably their most loved son, I'd say. Um, so they had a hooker who was um, actually contracted for the Canterbury Mitre Ten season, obviously but he had a broken arm. So he wouldn't be available for most of their club rugby season. Um, and they basically, the, the Canterbury coach saw my footage and he was like, I'm, um, I'm actually quite impressed, which I was shocked by for starters. Never thought a, a Canterbury coach would be impressed by my footage. I think I think that's um, the, like the biggest compliment anyone can ever get. Is, if, if, so, if someone from the Canterbury rugby system comes up and goes, "I'm impressed by you," I would immediately my heart would just go, "Oh, thank you so much." <laughs> um, so he was impressed, um, and then he he obviously he had a chat to my manager and was like, "All right, so there's a club here called New Brighton. They've got a hooker we've actually already signed, but we're unsure if he'll make it back um, for the Mitre season in time." So there's a spot available for a hooker at club level. Um, there's no guarantees for a Mitre 10 contract, but if you come over, play well, um, you know, I'd be more than willing to, to give you an opportunity. But, you know, again, nothing's guaranteed. You've got to come and earn it. So I was like, it was literally, I think I got that call on a, um, I think it was on a Thursday. Um, I had a, couple of days to chat about it with my parents they were obviously like I'd never left home before you know island Tongan families so close to the to the parents kids and all yeah. that you know like leaving home is like it's not <laughs> it's not so easy for us us boys no. um no matter how old you are amen <laughs> um, yeah amen <laughs> um, so there were, after a lot of tears and whatnot um I literally begged my parents. I was like, I've literally given my all to my footy for a lot of a lot of years now, um, you know, and I'm going to give it, like, I guess that was a big turning point for me and, and probably, like, you know, a big maturity thing and becoming a man, I guess, was being able to say to my parents, like, I respect your thoughts and, and you know, your opinions on this, but... Um, I feel like from, in terms of my life, this is something I want to try and, and I hope you can respect that. So regardless of, I obviously wanted their blessing, but I was at a point where I was like, um, I'm going to do this regardless of, you know. But yeah, my parents came around. They were understanding of the fact that, you know, they'd seen how much work I'd put into my footy and, and haven't, hadn't really seen any reward yet. Um, so I was like, let me go play a few months here, see how it goes. If it doesn't work out, I'll come back. 
I'll call it a day on footy and I'll I'll give I'll give everything to my study, get my degree, get on with life, you know. Um, and so yeah, I uh, had got that call on the Thursday. By the Tuesday, I was on a plane to New Brighton, and and um, <laughs> it was the coldest time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> going from sunny Queensland, yeah. Um, but I guess yeah, going over there mindset, I was like, man. The Crusaders are just like Canterbury Crusaders. Anyone from that region must just be like superhuman, you know? Yeah. <laughs> when I when it came around to my first club game and, and I guess that whole season, um, I sort of realised that these these guys playing here literally weren't any better athletes than the guys I'd been playing with back in Queensland, like. They had two arms, two legs, and, and they weren't, you know, they weren't out of this world in terms of, of the talent they had. Like, I, I guess people probably perceive them to, to have, you know. Mm. Um, but the biggest difference I found was, um, or oh, sorry, one step back. I played, um, I played club rugby there so that, that season um, and, and played quite well. And um, yeah, luckily enough, made the mitre the mitre ten side for for Canterbury, the the squad. Sorry, um, but the biggest the biggest thing I found while I was over there was, for starters, the players weren't anything, you know, extraordinary. Um, but it was the the coaching, and and the systems they had in place. You know what I mean? They at training, we'd literally spend probably, I'd say, a, a solid 20 minutes to half an hour of basic skill work, you know, just catch pass, um, running lines, just stuff you wouldn't really, you wouldn't think, like, looking at the Crusaders and how well they play and whatnot, you know, you just, you wouldn't imagine that they'd be doing such basic things, you know, yeah. but I guess it's that skill execution of basic skill under in those pressure moments, mm -hmm. they're able yeah. to execute it. Whereas, you know, obviously players and teams that don't do that, um, obviously, obviously struggle. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess the big, my biggest takeaway was, was uh, that they're not, they're not honestly not anything special. Like there are a few rare talents there playing for the Crusaders and stuff, but on the whole, it's, it's, yeah. Their systems yeah. they have in place, it's their pathways. It's just, it's just like a well-oiled machine. The way, it, you know. yeah. Hello, you you and I have spoken countless times about the the Canterbury rugby system, and we've said similar things. It's it's the athletes. They're not out of this world, but they they do they do the small things. And what in regards to that system, what, what do you kind of want to ask Folletti in regards to that? Yeah. So I think moving. You're one of the very few players that have been blessed to um, have come through the Australian system from schoolboy level. So you've seen you've seen literally grassroots. Okay, you've come through South. You've been in the red system as a schoolboy. You know, um, Australian schoolboys twenties, and then back into a, a Super Rugby franchise in a development type of role. Going coming through that system and then going over to a New Zealand system where. A, Again, you had to fight your way through club rugby, but you did it. Comparatively, um, do you feel as though, would it be, I don't know the word, but you know, you've touched on it a little bit, but is it more than their systems as in, can you, do you see that the players, um, like what is it that is different compared like from the New Zealand system to Australia? Because you're right, you know, you, there's not a Dan Carter all over New Zealand. You know what I mean? There's no Richie McCaws everywhere. So, you know, we're talking, you know, ath athletically real similar players, but there is con a considerable difference across all platforms from schoolboys to club to Mitre 10 to Super Rugby to All Blacks. So what would be – what do, or what are some of the things that you think are the difference that makes them be – 
that well-oiled machine does it come back down to using a using the car analogy does it come down to the coaching the mechanics the does it come down to the business how the business is run like what what is it do you think because you've done it both and you're one of the rare players that gets to do it both uh, at a high level uh that's a tricky one i don't i feel like there's no there's obviously no one answer or one solution Mm -hmm. to to that all um but for starters, I feel uh, they've got their talent identification on lock. Like um, yeah. when they, they see someone that's got some traits which are, you know, which stand out, um, they're quick to, you know, get in his ear, have a chat, I guess, see how, how they can develop him, get him into the system. Yeah. Um, I feel they do that better for starters. Uh, secondly, um, regardless of who you are, you know, how big you are, how much you lift in the gym, whatever, they're going to, they're going to feel the best 15 week in, week out, like full stop. Yeah. I feel like when you do that, there's constant competition for spots. Guys are constantly pushing themselves to be better players. Um, so, and then also, you know, it's it's their their brand of, of rugby. Like it, it never changes the way <laughs> you play footy. You know what I mean? Regardless of yeah, bro. There's uh, one thing. You... Sorry, yeah. I was just gonna say the one thing TJ and I discussed the style of rugby, and you know, I, I I'm I've been very vocal about the disparity between the Kiwi teams and the Australian teams in regards to Super Rugby and what we're seeing, the standard that we're seeing. To no offense. Um, but it comes down to New Zealand rugby all in all from club level, schoolboy level up to the All Blacks. It's not, um, let's, uh, let's make use of the ball. It's not like, um, a tactic where it's like, okay, cool. Let's wait. Let's wait for a mistake. It's, we take our, we've got the ball, get it off us. Not, okay, cool. We want to use the ball. Do you know what I mean? It's like, well, we've got the ball. Now you've got to take, like, we're not letting this go take it off us. Would that be a fair assessment, do you think? Sorry, bro. My um, Matt Hodgson just walked past. So. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we'd all I think we'd all take a take a pause and just and just chill and just do that. Yep. Just yeah. hands off. Yeah, right. Um yeah, no, so just, just pretty much just like my own personal assessment of you know New Zealand rugby at at all levels was it's once we've got the ball, get it off us. Uh, so we make use of the ball. We take the opportunities. Whereas Australian type of rugby is, you know, let's use the ball how we think, you know, let's, let's use this territory. Do you know what I mean? Let, you know, they're willing to sacrifice um, time with the ball in the hope that someone else, the other team makes a mistake. Whereas Kiwi rugby, it just seems like, well, you're going to have to do something to disrupt us because we're not giving it to you. And and in our, our defense as well, we've spoken about the Western force, how they do uh, kind of mirror and have similar aspects of some New Zealand teams. So we look at some play that maybe John O'Lance has done or, or something that you guys are doing as a pod. And we look at you guys and we say, this looks very New Zealand-esque. It's, it's a very... Crusaders or or Blues like yeah. opportunity it, that you guys it, take. Just go back to listen to the older podcast. Like I've, I've been riding, we've been riding the Western Force all year, bro. We're, <laughs> we're on that bandwagon, bro. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's like from the from the as I said when I first rocked up at the Western Force, um, we had a new coach in Tim Sampson, um, and his his big thing, you know, is um, playing what's in front and and um, sort of not having a push. Like we've, you've got a you've got a certain system in place and, and an idea of how you want to play, but it, go, it goes back to you know grassroots footy when you're running around with your mates. When you see yep. some space or a gap or whatever, yeah, you, you go at it. You play regardless of what the coach said. Oh, you need to you need to hit this certain spot in the field or whatever. Like. Yeah. Um, I feel like um, Australian, ru- Australian rugby generally gets into a habit of that. It, it's definitely improving um, from what I've seen, but yeah. um, it's 
you know, still not at that level where, um, you know, players are literally prepared to just see the opportunity and, and, and try and take, just it, take by it by the yeah. throat, you know. Yeah. Um, Agreed. Which is what New Zealand, like, Kiwi sides do. Like, regardless of, you know, where they are on the field or whatever, if there's a <laughs> gap, and that's why they, it's just so exciting to watch their games because you, you actually don't know what's going to happen. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's unpredictable. And just just before we talk about the Western Force, you also went over to Japan as an as an injury cover for Kibu, uh, Kibodo or Kibota okay, uh, yeah. Rugby Club in Tokyo. Um, so the people that I've spoken to who who have gone over to Japan or. or or kind of just even experienced it. Rugby in Japan is a massive vibe. I, I really got to see that when I went over for the World Cup last year. Aside from the language barrier, what did you find was the biggest difference from Japanese rugby to Australasian rugby? Um, it's a tricky one. Obviously, you know, there's only there's only very few foreigners in in, in sides, um, and and majority of teams are made up of, of Japanese players. Um, so you got to watch out for your knees because <laughs> the, the boys aren't as good as they, uh, they know how to, they definitely know how to kamikaze your, uh, your knees. Yeah. It's, oh um, man, those, but, those guys yeah, have got no, no it was fear. Honestly, that, um, little stint in Japan, like it wasn't long and the game I was actually meant to cover for, um, a typhoon had hit that very day so i didn't actually end up playing but i'd oh spent goodness. a few weeks training there um and it was just it was unreal um yeah love japan i can't wait to go back one day hopefully yeah. hmm. so we'll move on to the team that you're currently with so obviously you, you signed with the western force in 2018 yeah. Obviously, at the time, Western Force are playing in the Rapid Rugby competition. And I've spoken to a few people who played in this competition, like we spoke about before, some people who played in the, the Samoan side or even the China Lions. Um, a lot of people say that it's a bit different. It's, it's, it's a lot faster. What was your initial reaction playing in a competition like this, that brand new, uh, very, very unique? Uh, for starters, I knew I probably had to run a bit more, maybe drop an extra <laughs> kilo or two, <laughs> maybe eat a less, eat a bit, um, a bit less uh, tom and food and whatnot. Yeah, bro, it's gonna drop that cassava, <laughs> G. <laughs> no more little sippy um, for you, my man. Yeah, no more little sippy. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was actually like so exciting, and it it suited exactly. Um, obviously, we had to adapt as players growing up, you know, playing the same rules all the way through. Um, but, yeah, our, our head coach, Tim Sampson, you know, got us in in, in good nick and, and um, had us had us training the way we wanted to play, so playing to space. Obviously, with rapid rugby, you can't kick out on the full um, from your 22. So you've literally either uh, got to play out from your 22 and just, just make sure you don't, drop the ball, I guess, and, and give them quality ball inside your, um, you know, that like that close to, to the try line. Mm -hmm. um, or you, you kick it downfield and, and just make sure you've got a good D line coming through. But mm -hmm. um, I guess getting out of that habit of, of, you know, super rugby and stuff where you get, you get deep in your own 22 and you just want to kick it out to relieve mm -hmm. pressure like, in terms of fans watching, that was really exciting because mm -hmm. um, we also had power tries, which is where you go the length of the field and you get, I think it was nine points. Yeah. Um, no conversion yeah. required. Um, so that we'd have certain plays where we'd actually, like we had plays in, in place to actually try and get a power try, you know. That's As a so player, like, it, was, it was really new and exciting. Um, yeah, I, I loved every minute of rapid rugby, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, and there's, there's, but rapid there's rugby a, was amazing is amazing i should say yeah definitely it definitely is amazing and, and there's there's a few interesting teams in the competition you got uh so for super rugby you're obviously playing against uh five five australian teams and you're playing against five new zealand teams in a traditional competition you'd play against 
a few South African teams. But in this competition, you've got guys like coming from teams from the China Lions, who obviously based out of Rotorua, um, for the they have their association with the Bay of Plenty. Uh, you've got a Samoan team, you've got a Fijian team. What's what's it like going up against um, possibly guys you've never played against, or just different dynamics of those teams? Yeah, I guess it's just that ex- exposure and and being able to develop like you know different styles of play how you might want to play up against a, a side like the Fijians for example that you know for some some like crazy um, reason seem to get the ball out of anywhere no matter you know, <laughs> you know what I mean like offloading <laughs> stuff like um, so yeah for me it was it was that ex- exposure to um, I guess coming up against different packs and and how you'd approach, you know, those those um, different challenges. Um, but then also, you know, the aspect of, of traveling to those different parts of the world that you'd never seen before. I'd never thought in my wildest dreams I'd end up in Hong Kong or, mm. you know, um, yeah, be able to uh, walk around the streets of Fiji and stuff. It was just, it was, it was, it's honestly been an unreal, like, past two years. Yeah, yeah. Hello, do you have anything to add before I ask my last question? Uh, no, nah, man. No, nah, not yeah. at all. Rapid rugby is amazing. We actually, yeah. TJ and I were talking about like coming into the Super Rugby AU season and uh, we both highly rated the Rapid Rugby because of the Rapid Rugby you guys have been playing to be actually the fittest Australian team. Uh, we thought that you yeah. guys would be able to um, not only be competitive, but we think that like push the limits, which you guys have been. Um, yeah. And I just, yeah, like, like, I think, I, I think if, if when you when you look at that first round, um, there's probably only one game where we were clearly outdone in mm-hmm. in that Brumbies game where we yep. were held flawless. But you look at all those other games, like um, I feel like we just had you know little minor lapses in in, ex- in terms of execution and stuff that probably cost us a game. But yeah, we yep. were definitely in it. Um, Dude, and I think across the board of all games, you guys have definitely looked the faster, fitter team on the paddock for 80 minutes. And I actually said this at our podcast yesterday. You're the only team that I've seen actually play 80 minutes of rugby. Yeah, um, you know, 100%. The, other, the others have sort of, you can see um, they're relying on their systems that they have in place, whether it was with the Brumbies using their forward pack to really just just use their size and their the, the, the knowledge that they had. Um, but, you know, they, they, get, they, they were gassing. And then when they were gassing, they just shoot straight to the backs. And you know what I mean? Um, and it's been real. like, I've, we've both thoroughly loved the uh, watching the Western Force. And um, I still reckon there's, an up, there's upsets coming. There's upsets yeah, coming, no, Fletty. Definitely. I can feel I it in my loins, Toko. I'm sure. <laughs> um, uh, I've got no doubt the boys will do a job tomorrow night. Yeah. And, and some course. people will argue that, that your team came and saved the day. Uh, so, obviously – pandemic it's it's uncharted territory no, nobody really knew what to do and how to handle it and how to how to go from having such a big downfall but when you guys came and they were forming the super rugby au and then a lot of people were saying reach out to the western force and they eventually did reach out to you guys Hala and i have both gone on record that saying getting rid of the western force was probably one of the biggest mistakes that the aiu has ever made and um but, but now that you're back, do you believe that the force should be included in these future competitions? Yeah, I, uh, the tricky one, because, you know, obviously I love rapid rugby. I'm loving this, uh, this Super Rugby Australia uh, competition as well. Um, I guess it's obviously not in my hands. I'm just here to do a job and, and make sure I um, keep performing on the field. Um, but in, yeah, in terms of our in terms of our our team, um, we trust that uh, you know the higher powers in, in Andrew Forrest and Matt Hodgson um, that they've got our best interests in place. And uh, you know, in terms of obviously, there's a few guys in our side um, that are eligible for for Wallaby selection and stuff. So mm-hmm. um, you know. In, that's yourself in included too. You got you got to remember that you're yourself included. You're you're eligible for that. Uh, nah, bruh. Skip the wallaby but... straight to Tonga, bruh. Straight to Tonga, <laughs> G. Still a, still, still, a, still a way to go. Still a way to go. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, you know, I guess putting putting ourselves in a position where we're getting looked at week in week out. I'd, I'm not sure how much um, that was happening previously when we were just in rapid rugby. Mm. Um, you know, there's there's new management and um, with Rugby Australia now. So, you know, I guess uh, I can't speak on behalf of them. But, um, yeah, I'm sure it'll all take care of itself in, in due course. And regardless yeah. of um, what competition we're playing in, um, you're still going to see us, you know, with the same brand of rugby. Just And, and it, like, it, it comes back to um, that feeling I, I had when I'd play with my my brothers at South or at Nudgy and stuff like that's literally the feeling I get when I run around with these boys here at, at the force. Awesome. Like that's it's literally, yeah. um, it's literally a brotherhood. Like, you know, we, we're all professionals and, and get paid to do what we love for a living. Um, but there's definitely that emotional connection to one another in the Jersey because um, we were kicked out, you know, we were the outcasts and coming into this comp, like, no one expected us to ever get close to any of these sides, you know, and, and that's that's um, no excuse for having uh, lost, you know, having not won a game yet. But I mean, like people were people were putting us down, like quite, uh, you know, weren't giving yeah. us a shot at all. So yeah, um, yeah, that's. I can't speak high, highly enough of the Western Force and, and the group of men that I get to run out with on the weekend. Yeah, I, think, yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I th- Obviously, it's it's very hypothetical at this point because you guys still obviously have to finish this AU season. But I, I think you, you, you said it perfectly. It's wherever the Western Force go, they're going to be terrors on the field. And I think you guys have built a really good culture. So uh, I wish you guys all the best and, and yes, proud sir. of you guys on what you're doing for Western Australian rugby as well to promote that for grassroots. Uh, but it, but it's called the bonus point for a reason. And the bonus point segment today is going to be a bunch of question, questions our listeners and our fans have submitted in. So as soon as I said that I was bringing you on the show, I had so many people come out with all these questions firing it at me. So we've got about... Uh, well, a few questions to fire at you real quick. Um, and the first question is from my mate, Tohor. Uh, he asks, how has it been with Richard Kahui coming into the squad? <laughs> He's a, like, I'd say if I was, uh, I was still in that innocent mind that I had back at, um, you know, the Reds and the country days, I wouldn't have gone near him. But, oh, like, he is such a good man, like, humble as hell. You know, like, you, you talk to him just like, just like another bloke um and also like he is like disgustingly good looking so (laughs) (laughs) russ not ugly man not ugly that's that's what we said like when um when me and hala saw he he signed and we saw the first video and everything we lost it and we saw the first game play and i go how does he still look this good and still have the salt and pepper in the hair and he's he's got everything he's a bastard i tell you good genetics man uh, yeah. Oh, like yeah. I, I tried to fight him the other day when he took his shirt off at the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him emasculate you, Felini. Oh, Don't right. let him do <laughs> that, G. <laughs> All right. Well, the, the next question comes from um, one of one of our other fans. His name's Jeremy Wolf. Uh, first question is, he's got two questions. What do you think about the rule variations in the AU comp? So obviously you've gone and you've learned about all these new rule variations in rapid rugby. What do you think about the traditional sense of the game with the goal line dropout or the 50 22. What, what do you think about it? Um, I don't really know what to, we haven't had too many of the, of the dropouts yet. I, I don't think, um, you know, I mean, from an attacking perspective, like if you're hot on the line and you get held up over the line, it's quite demoralizing to, to not have a five meter scrum as you traditionally would, you know, to have to re- now you, you have to retreat and receive a, um, a dropout. I guess it's just a different, added a different dynamic to the game. And, um, you know, I personally would prefer to get held up over the line and then pack a scrum and walk over the top of the other forward pack. But <laughs> Yeah, um, tell them, tell them. <laughs> but like, but then again, on the flip side, defensively, um, I feel like, yeah, defensively it, it, it rewards the 
the defense for you know mm. holding the ball up. Um, so I get yeah, it's yeah. It's a bit so you're, you're a bit, you're a bit really split. A definite, you're yeah, a bit I'm split. Pretty, with I'll it. sit on the fence on that one. I actually don't know because yeah. I. Mm. Yeah, I'll okay. Sit on the All fence. right. Well, the second question from Jeremy is, and we're obviously wearing our island shirts today, uh, repping, repping the island culture. What, what is your thoughts about this new Pacific Island team that may join a Super Rugby competition? And where do you personally think it should be based? Um, I, think, I think it would be, a, you know, I think it would be game changer. It would be a game changer. For, for rugby, you know, like um, I don't know the exact percentages, but it's it's quite high in terms of the the Pacific um, Pacific Island contingent in in, ter- in all rugby sides across the world. You know, there's like every rugby side around the world, you're bound to find you know a few island players. So um, to have a team that that focuses on on um, developing Pacific Island talent. Um, like a funny story, I'm, I'm good mates with um, Nella, like you know, because uh, when he first moved over to um, to play for for the Reds, um, I was the only Tongan in the side that could probably that could speak Tongan at that stage. So oh, his English okay. wasn't as good as it is now, and he's not as loud as he, he wasn't as loud as he is now. <laughs> um, That's an understatement. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. So me and Nella would, um, uh, you know, I'd be able to talk to him in Tongan and, and help him out a bit and whatnot. Um, but, you know, you, you think, you look at Nella and you're like, mate, this guy is like superhuman. Like, how do you have legs like that? And how do you move that fast? And then you go over to Tonga and there's like, there's Nellas walking around everywhere. everywhere. You know? like, <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, and, and you know, the same goes for Samoa and every other, you know, all the other island nations. But um, I feel like obviously kids coming out from the islands don't have the same opportunities that us, you know, in, in Western society are afforded. Um, so I think if they, I don't know where that team might be based, but if, if they can get some, um, you know, pathways in place to be able to identify, you know, identify some kids with some talent and I know they I know they are doing that at the moment it's um I know Totai Totai is um a part of the world rugby um organization and he goes over to and they have the the Pacific Island combine or something like yep. that where they have my uh, they, my roommate um Henry Stowers so he's our number or has yep. been playing yep. number 6 for beast. us beast um, beast of a player yeah, he's awesome he's a beast he's a beast um he Actually, so he, <laughs> funny story about him. Sorry, I don't know if I'm taking up too much time. No, 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 here you no, go, here no, you no, go. Give us, give us all the funny stories. I'm getting hungry, we've been talking for so long. But <laughs> um, So Henry, you know, came out of Wellington um, and he was, uh, I think he played New Zealand, I think he played New Zealand schools, I'm not too sure, but he was a freak. Like he was picked up by, after playing New Zealand uh, New Zealand, oh, he captained Samoa in 20s and then the year after played New Zealand 20s and I think I'd heard he'd, he'd got invited to like All Blacks camps and, and whatnot um, you know at that age so obviously he had something special you know um, and then I think he was with the with the Canes and the Chiefs for a bit and, and things sort of didn't work out and I think he was at a, at a point in his career as well where he was like oh do I you know, do I call it a day or do I give it another crack? And someone gave him a lifeline, and he um, he ended up at that um, that combine. And I'm, yeah. I can't remember where it was. I think it was in Tonga. Um, but he obviously impressed there. Um, the current Wallabies attack coach, uh, Scott Wisemantle, mm-hmm. he ran that combine and identified. Henry obviously as a, as, a, as a special talent and got him his gig over here at the force. But wow. you know, to as, for someone who's a testament to the to the talent in uh, in the islands, and then obviously, you know, when guys are given an opportunity from those islands, just you know what they can do with it. So mm-hmm. definitely, um, moving forward, yeah, I think it's it, it, 
would be awesome to see a, a Pacific Island side um, that's able to tap into those sort of those sort of areas. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, our next question comes from my mate, uh, Maletti's. Uh, he's from Cal Poly Rugby. Uh, big shout out to Cal Poly Rugby in San Luis Obispo, California. Um, he asks, what skills did you acquire or learn at a professional level that you may not have thought about or may not have had at the grassroots level? Yeah. Um, obviously, as a, a, you know, a Tongan kid, my old man from a young age just taught me how to tackle hard, run hard, you know, <laughs> run straight. Um, so I've, I've always sort of kept that with me. But um, as a hooker, the, the biggest learnings that I've had in, in my professional career is, you know, I guess the, the dark arts of the scrum and, and the line out. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, set pieces is, is crucial for uh, a team's possession. You know what I mean? Like making sure you 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 win your line out ball, um, and and that you're dominant at scrum. Like being in the forwards, if you're if it's a tough day at the office and the other you know the other team's literally just absolutely tearing you to shreds in the scrum, like you don't want to be there on the field, you know, like it's, it's literally a man, it's man against man in the scrum. And if you're not, if you're not getting the ascendancy there, like it affects your whole game, your, your backs don't get yep. front football. Um, you know, it, yeah. The impacts of, of not being dominant at set piece and clinical at set piece, are, um, it's, it's, it's vital to, to success. So that's, that were, those were my biggest learnings. Like I've, I've had access here at the force to um, some exceptional, um, you know, older heads in, in the likes of like Greg Holmes, Heath, Heath Testman, um, mm. Michael Foley was an, you know, a Wallabies hooker, you know, classic hooker, yeah, classic Wallabies hooker, and, and I've um, I've been lucky lucky enough to to be able to learn off them and, and pick their brains about how I can. Um, you know, become better in those areas because that's at the end of the day, um, that's my role in the team is as a hooker is to scrum well, nail my throws and stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess it and it also it, it's nothing that you you don't pick it up overnight and you have it. It's something that you've you've constantly got to work on day in day out. And develop, make sure yeah, you're definitely. Yeah. All right, so that's I know I know you're. Yeah, no, it's definitely definitely a good question. We've got some good ones. And I know I know you're a bit hungry and I know you've got to get a feed on, so I'll, I'll keep it to two more questions and then one real quick one because this one's going to be a doozy. So our next question <laughs> is all about international rugby. And obviously you've played Aussie schools, you've played Aussie 20s, and you've got the opportunity to play for the Wallabies at some point if you get that opportunity. But our next question from David Marga, will you be eligible for the Tongan national team for the 2023 Rugby World Cup? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm always, uh, eligible for, for Tonga. Um, obviously I'm still quite young now in my career at, at 25. And, uh, personally, my dream's always been to pull on that gold jersey. I've done it at schoolboy level, done it at 20s level. And I guess the, the natural, uh, progression would be to, to hopefully pull on, uh, the Wallabies jersey. And, it wasn't ever, um, you know, it, it was never really a reality uh, in, in years gone by with with playing um, out of Super Rugby, you know. Like, I, I'm not sure how much we were getting looked at and, and, and stuff. Mm. Um, but now being in the limelight of Super Rugby, like, um, you know, it's it's a genuine possibility that if, you, if you're performing, you could get picked. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely I'm a proud Tongan through and through. Um, yeah, buddy. But born in Australia, <laughs> being born in Australia, raised in Australia, um, that that's that's the ultimate goal for me is being able to, to pull on that gold jersey and, and not just pulling it on and, and being satisfied with that, but like I guess trying to be a part of a of a revolution for Australian rugby where. You know, we can we can change the game up and, and um, take take the Wallabies jersey to a um, 
to a point, you know, to, to where it was, where it has yeah. been in the past, winning World yeah. Cups and letters lows and all that, you know, getting rid of this this idea that New Zealand is so much better at rugby because that like man to man, like they're actually not like they're not any stronger. Woo! That gave me goosebumps. Oh man. I'm oh. just saying I think I think I think it starts with the all tongue in front row. I'm just doing that one. Yeah. Talking, that's me talking out loud. I don't know I'm if it's gonna, but like if I ever had the privilege of, of um pulling on the gold jersey one day no matter how long it might be away um that's that's personally what i'd try and aim to to achieve yeah. there. if that if, if anyone that's watching this live or is, is streaming it eventually if that doesn't pump you up uh <laughs> wow also Folletti now has a target on his back from every Kiwi player. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> from everyone, sorry. from every Kiwi player, get him, bro, get him, yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we've we've gone on record and we've said that you definitely deserve that. So I I think that we we obviously have aspirations for that to happen for you. We do hope in that you you get that opportunity. Um mm-hmm. and and Australia doesn't lose a quality a quality talent like you. So let's let's hope that 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 does happen eventually down the road. Um, if not sooner, sooner rather than later. Um, but we'll, we'll finish off with one question and one, one really quick, quick question. So the, the one is what's your opinion on an integrated competition with New Zealand? So you've, you've obviously spoken about them and do you think it's the right move to keep Australia as their own competition or integrate New Zealand and keep that, keep that rivalry going? Um, be you can be you can be torn on torn on this one as well if, if yeah. you want to. No, I don't think I'm, I've, I've I've got a pretty solid opinion on this one to be honest. Like to be the best, you've got to beat the best, and currently they're the benchmark. So if we want to uh, get to a stage where you know we're beating them, we've got to we've got to test ourselves against them. We can't hide from that. I, I feel yeah. correct. Um, Amen. I actually I actually don't look into or haven't looked into the debates about what we should do with comps and all that um but yeah i feel i feel it's it's necessary um it's critical actually for australia's development to as a rugby nation to be able to test themselves against the kiwi sides like how will we ever know if if we're not playing them yeah Great answer. No, I'll definitely take that one. All right. So just, just to finish off really quickly, uh, just, just a one word answer for this one. Um, this is from another question from David Marga. Would you ever consider playing in a competition like the major league rugby competition? So obviously I'm based in America. Would you ever consider playing for that competition? Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, you know, obviously not at this, this point in my career where I've got higher aspirations uh, within Australia and stuff, but um, never say never, I guess. Like, you don't know what happens down the track and whatnot. Um, yeah, my, my wife's uh, got some, I like quite a lot of family in America, and so do I. Um, but, I, yeah, never say yeah. never, I guess. Great. All right. Well, that's that's a that's a big ups for some MLR fans that will obviously be listening to this podcast. They'll be maybe <laughs> see see you and see you in a jersey eventually. And you got to come visit us when Hull is back in America. Yeah, um, maybe. But bro, it was it was great to catch up. So so glad you're finally getting a chance to showcase your talent and in such a premier comp like the Super Rugby AU competition. Also putting Western Australian rugby on the back on the map. Um, yes. Obviously, you won't be playing tomorrow, but but we wish you the best in your match against the you Reds um, as a team, and we sure just can't wait to see you in your, in your next performance. It's it's going to be great, and obviously you'll be cheering for the Force, but it'll be against your hometown rivals. You know some of these guys, so it'll be an interesting matchup to watch for you on the sidelines. Is is there anything else you want to share before we let you go? Uh, no, like I, I'm only uh, you know three years into living at Perth, but um, apart from my family being over in, in, in Queensland, like it, it really feels like home there now for me, you know, um, in, in Western Port, at, uh, the Western Port, sorry, and in Perth. Um, but yeah, no, thanks very much for having me, boys. It was a pleasure oh, to good, um, man. catch up yeah. with you guys. Dude, it's great to, um, it's great to see you. I remember you running around as a little 13 year old in the blue and white jersey. So to see you, <laughs> see your journey, and see how far you've come and the obstacles you've overcome has been a pleasure, Doko. So, um, my love for being on the show with us. 
Thanks, boys. No, thanks, okay. brother. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon. And, um, yeah, thank you very much for joining the Bonus Point Rugby Podcast. Awesome. Thanks,